Welcome back, scholars, to yet another riveting edition of our journey through the number system galaxy. To date, we've talked about natural numbers, whole numbers, rational numbers, integers, and we've arrived in a actually separate galaxy altogether known as the irrationals. So for today's content, we're going to be learning about the irrational numbers so that I can simplify square roots and rationalize denominators. I'll know I've got it when I can successfully apply operations with square roots. Vocabulary for today's content includes irrational number, radical, like radicals, perfect square, and rationalizing the denominator. Let's begin. Included a little cartoon. The number eight says to pi and the square root of two. Don't you think you guys should stop fighting? You're both being irrational. We're gonna talk a little bit about what makes a number irrational, like pi and like the square root of two. So we define a number to be irrational if it can, um, I should say can't, be written as a decimal that neither terminates nor or repeats. These numbers cannot be written as the ratio of integers. So the reason why pi is considered an irrational number is because pi continues on indefinitely. The square root of two also has a similar behavior. If you take, enter either of these into a calculator, um, they will continue to have a new decimal value um, and to this day have unable to um, terminate. So in your own words, what makes a number not rational? And that'll bring us to square roots. When we are calculating square roots, we are identifying the non-negative number you have to multiply by itself or square to get x. Let's identify some vocabulary. We know that this is a square root because there is an imaginary two in this location. Remember that this is known as the index because we can also have cube roots, we can have fourth roots, fifth roots, so on and so forth. This symbol itself is known as the radical. And in this instance, it's an x, but it could sometimes be a number, sometimes it could be an algebraic expression. And that is what we refer to as the radicand, because you can do it. My dad jokes are hilarious. In certain cases, where the number under the radical is the square of an integer, such as 16, 25, 36, right? And respectively, those are 4 to the second power, 5 to the second power, and 6 to the second power. We call these perfect squares. We like perfect squares. We're able to calculate intuitively perfect squares. But how do we go about simplifying a radical? Well, if we can't factor out a perfect square from the radicand, radical is already simplified. So let's take a look at what that actually means. Okay. Let's take a look at something like the square root of 72. The square root of 72, I can factor as SQRT will give me the square root symbol. SQRT Notice, I've factored apart 72 into the square root of 9 times the square root of 8. So I'm always trying to think, is there a perfect square that divides into the current radicand? I know that the square root of 9 is 3. I can rewrite that as 3, but I do not know the square root of 8 because it's not a perfect square. However, I can reapply this factoring process. When we see something written like 3 square root of 8, don't forget, if there is no operation, we intuitively know it to be multiplication. I wanted to factor apart the square root of 8. I could really rewrite that as the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. You can know that the square root of 4 is really 2. So we have 3 times 2, square root of 2. 
since the coefficient of the radical is located outside, we multiply the 3 times the 2, and our final reduced form of this radical expression is the 6 root of 2. Had you noticed that 72 could be factored as the square root of 36 times the square root of 2, we would have, we would have been able to be more efficient. Does it necessarily matter? No. Slow and steady wins the race. Efficiency wins the race. I just want you to win the race. I don't care how you win the race. Okay? So, once again, we're looking for what perfect square can factor the original radicand. So, perform that in A, B, and D. Remember, if there is no perfect square that can factor the radicand, it is already in simplified form. Which brings us to our properties of nth roots. Okay. If you want to type an nth root into Desmos, we will literally type, type nth root. One of those properties that we just examined was when there is multiplication beneath a radical symbol, we are able to multiply each component separately. And the same holds true for division. Now, as far as addition and subtraction, it works very similar to adding and subtracting rational numbers. So we do not change the value of the radical. That's very reminiscent of the common denominator. And what we will do is we will combine the values of the coefficients, which is our thought process with the numerators. Oops. Right. So don't forget words of wisdom that the product rule, right, our first expression that we can tease them apart does not work addition, hence why it's not called the sum rule. Okay. If we are adding two terms within a radical, we cannot tease them apart separately. Okay. Same way when you have a, a uh, sum or difference of an algebraic expression, and I'm over here talking. Vaguely, right? Same way when we have something like this, we can't just place the two as the exponent of both those terms. Okay, that is incorrect. If you're still sitting there saying, oh snap, I didn't know that, uh, that's okay. But there is a different uh, method, as is. Oh wow. The same for this. And adding and subtracting radicals works the same way it does with imaginary numbers and with arithmetic and integers. We add or subtract their coefficients and keep the radicand the same. We must identify those like radicals. So the reason why that becomes a complex process is because, as you can see in part C, we must first simplify the radical expressions in order to combine them. So I'm going to leave that for you, so that way you have a little bit more practice. But I can see in part A that I have the same radical expression, square root of 3, square root of 3, and square root of 3. So that makes all of these terms like. So I can, at this point, perform the operation being requested, which is addition. 6 plus 8 plus 5 will yield a 19. So my final value is 19 times the square root of 3. And it's very straightforward when we have like radicals, but we got to make sure that we're able to simplify the radicals just the same. And our last talking point for today's content is rationalizing the denominator. This is a pretty big deal and calculators didn't exist, but it's one of those um, archaic skills that mathematicians would like for you to know. Uh, so we got to do our due diligence and make sure that we go over it. When a radical expression contains a square root in the denominator of a fraction, 
it can be simplified by multiplying the numerator and denominator by a radical expression similar um, to, to rationals that will make the square root in the denominator perfect square. So in the case of part A, I have a radical in the denominator. I need to multiply 18 divided by the square root of 3 by some radical expression because I want to create a perfect square in this denominator. If I multiply, going back to, back to my properties of nth roots, Right, if I multiply two separate square roots with the same index, I can write them as, rewrite them as one radical and use their product. So if I have the square root of 3 and I multiply that by the square root of 3 again, it really becomes the square root of 9. I must replicate that motion in the numerator because the square root of 3 divided by the square root of 3 is really a 1. So we are modifying how this numerical value looks, but we are not changing its integrity or its structure. That is critical. And 18 and the square root of 3 are not um, able to be multiplied together because the 18 is a whole number while the 3 is a radical expression. I can, however, simplify denominator to reflect square root of 9, which is 3. And 18 divided by 3, we can do, because once again, those are whole numbers, completely devoid of a radical, which is equal to 6 times the square root of 3. It can become a little bit more complex, but for the most part, that is basically what we are doing. We are looking for what can we multiply the original denominator by, in order to create a perfect square. Typically, it's itself, but sometimes that requires you to do an extra, for, uh, extra step of simplification. But listen, like I said earlier in this video, I just want you to win the race. Don't care how you win it, but just want you to win it. So if that means you take three extra steps, you still win the race, you still won. That stops us at our enhancement opportunities and we'll pick up in lesson five with the real numbers.